As we gather together in God's house on this Christmas day, hear the angels say, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace toward men of God's good pleasure. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is surely in the name of Jehovah God. He's made the heavens and the earth, and he has redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb born this day in the city of David, born for you. Let's receive God's blessing as we enter worship. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord, through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue our worship in song and praise number 308. 308 in the Psalter hymnal. <clears throat> Let's sing the three stanzas, Alleluia, praise ye God. seated. <clears throat> what a blessed opportunity we have to give glory to God as the shepherds long ago went to Bethlehem to see this thing that had come to pass, the birth of Messiah, as we do every day and also in the house of God corporately together, we come to Jesus and we pray that those who are visiting with us this morning, we, we welcome you first of all, but you may be coming to Jesus here in this church and not just to church, but to the Jesus whom we worship and whose name is exalted above every other name. And we would now confess, and I'm going to read this Nicene Creed because it's, it's hard for us to memorize these things, but I'm going to uh, read this creed and we're going to make this our confession. It is the confession of the church of the faith that is uh, a summary, a faithful summary of the Holy Scripture. And let's, uh, and children, you can follow along here too. It's in the back of your Psalter hymnals, page four, the Nicene Creed, written in the fourth century AD. But notice particularly the truth of Christmas that's brought out here, the unadulterated truth of Christmas. There's no hoopla, there's no crutches, there's no whatevers. Uh, but there is truth, and that's why we're here, to confess the truth as it is in Jesus, and this is great joy. So let's all together in our hearts and, and with a resolution 
truly to believe these things, say this, I believe in one God, the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. Note this, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds. The eternal generation of the Son is spoken of there, as Micah the prophet had prophesied, the Son whose goings forth are of everlasting. But we believe that he's begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God. That's who Jesus is. He's God who comes of God. And he's light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, not a mere creature, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. Not a creature, he's the creator, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. There's the Christmas truth and gospel and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. In the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. This is our confession, people of God. Amen and amen. Let's now sing as we continue to worship from the Psalter hymnal number 340. 340 angels from the realms of glory will be speaking of these angels and the shepherds uh, who were in the fields abiding. Let's sing stanzas 1, 2, 3, and 5. 1, 2, 3, and 5 of 340. Let's pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, what great joy we have 
because we have a Savior. And you have given your Son in the fullness of the time we receive the gift every day of Jesus Christ the Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would be exalted, not only by angels, but especially by the redeemed, for whom the Son has come, for whom the Son is born, for whom the Son of your love, our Savior Jesus, has died. Lord, indeed, let us lead the way, even before the angels who themselves need not a redemption. May we lead the way in praise, in timbrel and dance. And may our joy, Lord, be full. And may it be a happiness of heaven. And may it be a peace that we have in our hearts for this Prince of Peace that's come. And may it be, Lord, that this propels us into our world, into this lost world, into this unrighteous culture, so that we can be witnesses as the shepherds of old, having been with Jesus and seen him, and not stumbled at the sign of his meanness, his littleness, that we may be as them who declare the truth as it is in Jesus, the salvation from sin in him alone, and this wonderful glory that he gives to God, and that sinners must give to God either by faith or in their unbelieving, and yet they must acknowledge that God is God in that even as they reject him. Lord, we pray that there may be your Spirit poured out upon the earth in mighty ways in these latter days, so that there might be this salvation of your own and the kingdom coming and this solidifying of the lines between the righteous and the unrighteous, so that the deceit cannot have its way and infiltrate the ranks of the church and of the sons of God. We pray for that here, Lord, that we may stand in these latter days on the truth of Bethlehem, the truth of the babe, the significance of his being made man in that he is made to be the sin sinner for us, the substitute, the perfect substitute for sinners on our behalf. We pray that we may stand and that as we hear what the world has to say, the wicked world lost in wickedness as the Apostle John reveals to us, we may filter out whatever grains of truth there are, whatever things we can acknowledge that are of you, and me ourselves may be able to be wise, and our young people may be able to be wise, and also positively Christian, and declaring not the world's truth, but heaven's truth. Lord, this day, there's so much goodwill, so much of a Christmas spirit with a small s, and it's easy to be taken into that, Lord, to celebrate our gifts to one another, to have this good feeling that we'll be gone tomorrow and then the, the, the complaining will start again. Lord, help us and may this worship service help us truly to remember the reason for the season and the reason why we live at all at any time. Lord, we pray then, may our time be full, may our time be redeemed, in the light of him who filled up time with his own presence. May our time be holy in light of him who has come and who is holy even by conception. We pray, Father, that since he has come and since salvation is brought nigh to us and your own presence in him, we may live as those who, having been saved, need nothing at all except the blessing of that salvation and we pray that we may then show off your glories as we seek the things above and not the things below. Lord, we pray for our church with thanksgiving. That's how we pray, first of all. You've been so good to us. You've given us the gospel of Bethlehem and of Golgotha and of the returning Son of God. The whole counsel of God you declare to us here. 
how much more we have than, than shepherds of old who were just dimly beginning dimly to be aware of the marvel of the promises of God fulfilled in Jesus. We have the whole New Testament. We have a theology of, of a Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Paul and Peter and James, and, and it's all one. The truth, the truth, the one theology of, of the gospel of our salvation. Lord, we've been given this. We've been given the Spirit. We've been given an earthly angel, indeed, in a servant of the Lord and a servant of the Word. And elders who care that this Word be ministered carefully, faithfully, clearly, powerfully, boldly, humbly, and for the salvation of this tender flock. Thanks, Lord, for this flock and for the great fruit in our midst of godliness. That's the fruit we seek. And to know Christ crucified in our midst, that is the fruit of faith in him. O oh Lord, we pray with gratitude. You've given this too in our children and young people so that we see a generation that's being raised and, and raised up even by the Spirit to be the sons of God for the next generation. We see, Father, opportunities. We have been given them in our own midst, in the visitors who come, and also over the radio, over the Internet, you have given us many opportunities to have the word go out so that we ourselves right here go tell it on the mountains and over the hills and everywhere that Jesus Christ is born. Lord, may we continue to be blessed. That's our prayer on this Christmas day that we may have joy and the fullness and fruitfulness of your Holy Spirit applying all that Jesus is and has done and does for us, that we may have peace, that we may have godliness, that we may have wisdom, and that among one another as we deal with one another uh, in a wise and peaceable way. We pray that we may have boldness to shout when the world is silent, also wisdom to be silent when the world would trip us up, Lord, we pray that you would bless each and every one who is worshiping today with forgiveness, with that blood that cleanses of all sin. And if there be some who are walking in sin, maybe disturbed by it all and not knowing what to do, give direction to the light of this word that we hear preached this morning. And all our day may it be spent, yes, with family and friends as you give, but especially with you. Hear our prayers. Guide us, Lord, and guide your church everywhere. And some of our own members, they're not here this morning, and we pray for them, that you would bless them with Christmas blessing and, and the blessing of, that awaits all those who put their trust in you. Hear us, O God of our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. We worship the Lord now in the giving of an offering for the general fund of this church.
Let's turn in our Psalter hymnals and sing the story of the shepherds and the visitation of the angels to them. 338, while shepherds watch their flocks by night. We're going to have to sing all the stanzas. I don't mind that. Six stanzas of 338 because it tells a story and we don't want to miss any of it. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the Gospel according to Luke. The Gospel according to Luke, the wonderful message of the birth of Christ Jesus and the first visits to Jesus and from heaven to earth and then out into the world. Great, great Gospel here. As we read this, perhaps for the umpteenth time, many of us, Let's remember this wonderful richness here of the Word of God and how deep it is, and also how, how it applies to today. Perhaps some of us have not read this so often. Here, here with us, this wonderful true story, this history of the birth of the Son of God. Luke 2, and we'll read the first 20 verses. Came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered or registered to be taxed. This census first took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, so all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. 
And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And what follows, verses 8 through 20, we'll especially uh, focus on here uh, briefly, however briefly, briefly in our worship, uh, this wonderful scene of the angels and the shepherds. Verse 8, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swathing clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told them. Thus far we read God's word, gospel according to Luke, wonderful gospel of our salvation, the birth of the Savior. I start this sermon out by saying and declaring to you that Jesus was white. Maybe he was olive colored. Certainly, Jesus was not black, not Mexican, not Asian, Dutch, or Italian. For indeed, he was Semitic, he was a Jew, and he was therefore of the color of the Jews. This Jesus, besides, I want to say to you, this Jesus who came to save his own and whose saving birth we celebrate, also came to condemn homosexuality and to condemn all those who do not condemn it, even as he came to condemn all sin and sinners and all who refuse to repent and turn to God and who deny that there's anything that needs repenting of or any God to turn to. Did you take that all in? I have now hereby reaffirmed to you that your preacher aims not to be politically correct, not ever, nor on Christmas Day. I am in good company because the gospeler, Luke, as we read him, when he wrote our Je uh, of Jesus' birth, himself was not aiming to be politically correct. He was inspired, in fact, by God, who himself would write to us just as it was and just as it came to pass and to pen the true record of heaven and of earth responding to this birth of Jesus. Luke far from being politically correct or aiming to be politically correct, was, was chopping, you see, and letting the chips fall where they may. He was speaking God's truth, and the truth might uh, not be hid by any who might like to cater to folks' sensibilities or to special interest lobbyists. For God would glorify his name on Christmas Day and in the inspired record of Jesus' birth, no matter what men may say. His was and ever is a message that transcends human notions and nations, a gospel that saves or damns regardless of the color of skin, rebukes and bashes to pieces all human prejudice, self-righteousness, all human religion, human politics, human health care, human rights, human peace, human liberty and justice for all. 
You see, Luke is a messenger of God. And he's out for one purpose, to give glory to God. And not is he a politically correct, popular opinion monger. Now, this is seen in a remarkable way in the narrative of Jesus' birth in Luke, where he records, in fact, which is our text, this record here, of the first Noel that the angels, angels did say that was to certain poor shepherds in fields where they were keeping their flock by night. We want to visit this, this wonderful history here this morning. We want to be a little creative this morning, and that is, you know, part of our image as God. We would show that creativity that is divine itself. So we want to imagine certain things that are true and imagine that it was night. Imagine it's night here. And imagine that Jesus has just been born. And the angels have visited distant shepherds in a faraway country surrounding the little town of Bethlehem. You see, we have to go back in our minds to this and, and be creative. We also want to be creative constructively and biblically and helpfully. Think about the present. That's what we want to do, and that's what we really we always do as Christians. We re revisit the history of this sacred word, and we think about the present. We want to apply what the angel said then, and we want to apply the truth, the godliness of the shepherd's own response to what the angels then did say. We want to apply that in our politically correct but unrighteous culture. We want to see, you, we want, and children, we want you to be on God's side here. On Christmas Day, not only, but every day of the end of this year and of the year to come. We want to address our culture and not be swallowed up by it. We want to be informing our culture in light of the word of the gospel, the word of Christ. We want to be those who are Christians in the world and thankful for the gifts of the world and even for some of the culture of the world, but constantly being informed by truth here and informing the culture of the truth as it is in Jesus. You see, we want to stand today on Bethlehem's ground, holy ground, where God took on human flesh and dwelt among us for us men and for our salvation. So, without at all being politically correct, but we pray faithful to God's word, let's hear of white shepherds watched their flocks. I want to just go right through the, the text here. I want to go verse to verse and, and history here to history in a kind of informal way, if I can do this on this Christian or this Christmas day, I want to meditate with you upon a few things and again make some sharp application. But about those shepherds, first of all. Of all people, God would reveal his son and his son's birth that very night that Jesus was born to shepherds shepherds. And that's how our text starts out. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, I hope that you sense the, the apparent incongruity here, the things that don't seem to fit together. The Bible is always doing that to, to startle us and to give us wisdom and, and to reflect on things. But the first seven verses are the most amazing verses of the most amazing thing that ever happened in time. God came to the earth in the person of his son, Jesus. And those first seven verses, uh, on them many a sermon has been preached, and, and preachers are always exhilarated to bring the sermons on that very high thing that happened in the fullness of time. But here you have in verse 8 this, this transition to a thing that doesn't seem to fit their shepherds now. Shepherds. Jesus is born. Isn't he the great shepherd of the sheep? Here we have shepherds. 
Well, God's good pleasure. Shepherds, they were ordinary shepherds who watched their flock by day and by night or otherwise protect them because their sheep or their goats or whatever animals are shepherded by them need their care. They're pretty helpless, these uh, sheep, and so they need care in Palestine, in America, or in Australia. Sheep are sheep. Shepherds must be shepherds. Now, these shepherds, the first thing I want to say about these shepherds in Israel is that they were white. They were white or olive colored because no doubt, as Jesus, they were Jews. And I make no apology for this at all. And I want to say that white shepherds, Jewish shepherds, were favored. They were the most favored of the people that night, at Christmas night. And they weren't black, they weren't Mexican, nor whatever race you might want them to be because otherwise your feelings might be hurt. These shepherds, though they were so favored, however, were not much in the eyes of the world because they probably weren't much good at reading, writing, and arithmetic. They weren't the scholars, the professional theologians like the scribes and the Pharisees, certainly not of those of great repute and high in the social echelons. They wouldn't be invited to all the parties. They didn't have the greatest reputation either for integrity. Uh, maybe, because, maybe because they didn't keep the laws, the ceremonial and the civil laws that were for Jews to keep, as well as the scribes and the Pharisees might have liked. Uh, perhaps their lifestyle made it hard for them. Certainly, they were hard-pressed, as was everyone else in that day of Jewry, to keep all of the extra laws that the scribes and Pharisees had added to the canon of the Scripture. So that Sabbath day's journey it was hard to, for them to keep, and all of the Sabbath laws and so on, uh, very hard for them to keep. And so they were looked down upon as the lower of the religious society, and they were just like the tax collectors. Besides that, they were known, that is, in general, maybe not this band of shepherds, but in general, shepherds were known to have fingers that would reach after things that were not theirs. They were dishonest. They were known for that. Thieves, just like those tax collectors for which the scribes upbraided them. So they were of disrepute or ill repute, and in fact... The laws of the land, at least of Jewry in that day, forbade the testimony of shepherds as witnesses in a court of law. Again, just like the women, they were regarded as low life and not trustworthy at all. Well, so that's the background of these shepherds. And again, it makes us to be surprised, doesn't it? God would visit shepherds who then would visit Messiah and God all but invited the shepherds to visit Messiah and to keep company with Jesus with shepherds of ill repute, first of all. Well, can you imagine there was some politically correct shepherd among the shepherds or watching angels visit the shepherds? Maybe there's some today who say and who know what shepherds are about. That just doesn't fit. And I suppose the Jews would laugh at this kind of a narrative in Matthew, in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and so on. But here's the message of the shepherds and God visiting them. The message is of grace. The message is of the grace of God. That's the message. The message of which James speaks to us when he says, Hath not God chosen the poor of this world? The poor of this world? The message of Isaiah, that God who transcends the earth and who inhabits eternity, nevertheless in mercy, comes down and condescends to dwell with sinners. And of the no account of the world and of the robbers and so on. They were graced in this visit. And I believe either before that, certainly after that, they were graced so that they became God-fearing. They became God-fearing people, these shepherds. And, and that, of course, was the wonderful grace of God. Well, that meant, of course, again, to 
follow along on our theme here, that the shepherds were those, the ones that God visited were those who were against homosexuality and adultery, by the way, of any kind and robbery, and murder, and losing your mind and wasting your life on the Internet. They were against all of these things because they were godly. And they cared not at all for ungodliness in their own lives and in others. So that's the shepherds. That's the background teaching of grace here and what grace does to the most, well, the most surprising sorts of people like you. And like me. But the focus here, right now anyway, is on the angels. The angels. The very important thing that stands out about these shepherds is that they're visited that night by angels. They don't, they don't gain in their uh, reputation nothing it would be said about them if they were not visited that Christmas night by angels sent by God. And by God, by the way, who is not out to please anyone but himself and to glorify his own son, whom he has just sent into the world. To have those shepherds visit one who is not Joseph's baby uh, baby and, and only Mary's partly, but his own baby. God is leading this whole thing, even though it could be said that by some and thought by some that Caesar was and his decree. Well, angels are said. And I want to say this, that if there again was someone observing these things, they'd think that wasn't a good idea for God to send angels to record things that had just occurred because, well, they'd be biased. They just have one opinion. They all come from heaven, one place. And we need a, a, a variety here. Maybe CNN would say that. They're not coming from the left, these angels are. They're coming from on high. They cannot possibly bring truth and good news and tax dollars to these poor shepherds. Away with their testimony. Nor, some other might say, do they claim to be fair and balanced, more conservative, and so how can we really accept the facts or the, the, the words of these angels and, and their songs even? How can we possibly get the fact of Christmas from these ones who are high and mighty and they're not of the people and they're not for the people and they're, well, they're not people. But angels, it must be. Angels sent to shepherds and, wow. First thing I have to say about these angels, they were white. Maybe not. Maybe they did not have a color. But they were bright. The glory of the Lord shone round about them. You'd be bright too, far brighter than you are, and I would too. If you spent your life in heaven, and there's God, and God is holy. Angels are sinless, and they spend their time in heaven, and something of the brightness of the glory of God rubs off on them. That's how the text describes angels, and that's why the people were so afraid. You'd be too if you saw an angel from heaven, you sinner, you, and, and I would be too. But my point is, they weren't black, they weren't brown. They were, if anything, white, just because they were pure. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. So glorious because sinless, dwelling in the presence of God. And so glorious because happy. Happiness does that to you you as well, you know. Because they have the prospect of serving God. The Bible says that angels are ministering spirits. Sent of God for God's cause, God's gospel, and God's people. Well, the first angel... What about them? Visits the shepherds, calms their souls, calls to them to be not afraid. I love that. Be not afraid. Behold, an angel of the Lord stands by. Those shepherds stands before them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were greatly afraid. The first message of the angel is do not be afraid. Calm down. I'm not here and God is not here through me and in my message to kill you. Rather, the first thing the angel would say is the first Noel, 
the first ever recorded message of the gospel of Jesus born this day. Amazing. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. Unpack that, people of God. Just think about that. Again, these, are, these individual words even are sermons and sermon material all by themselves. But just briefly, good tidings of great joy. That's it. It's the message of, of, of sin, the sin problem about to be taken care of. It's the message of this one who is the Christ, the Messiah of God, promised of old to be the Savior of Israel, promised now to Mary and to Joseph, and they had to name him according to the promise. He's Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. He's Emmanuel. That's why there's this virgin birth, Mary, that's why you're conceived by the Holy Spirit, that he might be God, purely God with us, though he's fashioned out of the DNA of your womb. He's God and man and with man appearing. He's a Savior. The, the good news, you see, is this, this great news, this thing that makes us so happy because God is taking care of the problems of problems and the problem of problems the sin, the evil, the hatred against God, the enmity against one another, the divorce, the homosexuality, the thievery, the robbery, the guilt of it all, the shame of it all. He's born to set the people free. He's born to die for you and me. Jesus Christ is born this day in the city of David. And amazing this is to all kinds of people, to all the people. Jesus Christ is born today. And again, how politically incorrect this is. And you see, lots of people are maybe even going to church, certainly celebrating Christmas and in a, in a vague sort of way, celebrating this, this baby Jesus. And the whole culture is taken up in this. But if they only really realized just how divine this whole day was and how holy God was showing himself to be, if they only realized that it is indeed, just like I said, your preacher preached, it's good news in that it's salvation from sin. If the world only realized that Christmas is not good news in that there's the good news of man now that is being brought out because there's another man who was a good man who's born this day and who taught virtue and this is the one we can follow. That's the sort of good news that the world thinks is Christmas Day. And they forget the cross. Do we forget the cross? Sometimes... When we celebrate the birth, we forget the cross and that he's born to die and that the Savior here is the one who comes for us sinners. See, this would really be offensive. If people only realized that Jesus Christ is the Christ who saves from sin, they'd be offended, and they are offended. It's not, you see, politically a, a correct to offend anyone and offend their sensibilities, whatever color. Jesus Christ is the greater offender of them all then because he comes and he says it like it is. He reveals truth as it is, the truth that we are all in Adam born dead in sins. And there's none righteous, no, not one. There's no government righteous, no, not one. There's no plan of governments and no peace talks of government that is born of the Holy Spirit, as far as I can tell. No, not one. Jesus Christ, you see, he, he faces us with the truth in his birth that we are in need. I can just see someone from CNN or even Fox News or whoever saying of this in the light of this, fact that Jesus is born for sinners, nah, 
Uh, I don't like it. And asking their preachers in their churches to tone it down. Let's just gather around the bait. Well, offensive. But now, more offensive perhaps, I suppose, is the next multitude of angels. The very army comes after that. The first one leads the, de- the way. The first Noel is that there is born to us this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the, the Lord. And this shall be assigned to you. And, and suddenly there is the, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And again, I can see one saying, well, the multitude here is just following the one and they can't be biased and this is not newsworthy, it's, it's all fake and these people are on the bandwagon, these angels. And maybe they put it all together and say if Christ died for sinner, if he is born for sinners, then his peace has to be the peace of God and not the peace of our alliances and our concords. And they'd say, well, that's impossible, that's not necessary. That's offensive, in fact. Peace, the peace of God on earth, peace of God and man, that's, that's, not, that's not what we're all about. That's not going to build a city of men. In fact, that gospel that the Christians say is gospel of peace, it's always gotten us in trouble as peoples of the world. The Christmas gospel of so-called peace is, is made for strife. Enough of the religion. That's the origin of conflict. And in, in many cases it has been. And Jesus Christ himself said, I came not to bring peace but a sword to the earth. Many people miss that. But be that as it may, people are critical of this. If they'd only draw the lines and put the the dots together with the lines of right theology, they'd see that the whole thing is offensive to the natural eye and mind and heart and to the lobbyist groups. Well, and then certainly they'd be offended at this if they understood the theologians and uh, the ones who, who translate correctly uh, this this verse of the the angel's song, glory to God in the highest, and because a, a proper translation and interpretation here, beloved, is glory to God in the highest, and on earth um, peace toward men of God's good pleasure. Really, that's the way some translations have it. That is an accurate and a faithful theological way of interpreting the message. You see, here the angels are saying. Not goodwill toward men, but peace toward certain men and women and children of God's good pleasure. That is, salvation to God's elect. That's what the angel is saying here. Not salvation to all, judgment to many, but salvation to some. Oh, you can see. The CNN political flags go up. What? 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 That's not fair. That's not fair at all. How can that be? Well, it's the way God has determined things. In fact, God sends Jesus, and he's the savior of his people from their sins, and he dies for his people, and he's now preparing heaven for his people. And when he comes, there is a judgment day, and there's a division between the sheep and the goats. And you see, Christianity is by nature on that score offensive. Not everyone's right with God, and it's only the grace of God that anyone is saved. And God doesn't owe it to anybody to save anybody. Doesn't owe it to you or to me. Well, this is offensive. And then you think of that sign, too, back to that sign of which the first angel spoke, the sign of the glory uh, of, of salvation in this one meanly wrapped. How can that be? There's going to be anyone of worth and of significance, of power and political might and so on, and that's what we need. It's got to be king and kingly. 
He's got to be someone who's born and everybody knows it because we recognize that from our own midst there's going to be one who's going to champion the things of man. No. The sign of Messiah and of God come down to sinners is poverty. That's what it is. Meanly wrapped, swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, no room in the inn. God making his way as the one who became poor, we might be rich. That's Christmas. Poor, that we might be rich. Poor. Well, oh, glory to God because of this. Oh, glory to God, right? Glory to God in the highest. That is, it may refer to in heaven, that's the highest. Or in the highest degree, Certainly, that's true, both of those. All glory to God because he's worthy. Well, again, the political rec- correct people would say, no way, no way, can't be, may not be. Because what you're telling me and what this gospel or Luke, who may be mistaken, is telling us is that there's just one God and one way of glory in his Son, And one way of worshiping by going to the sun and bowing, believing, can have that. Besides, it should be about glory to man in the highest. See, Christianity takes the wind out of the sails of man. Takes the foundation out of the foundations and the cities of man. Man would celebrate the potentiality of man, the accomplishments of man, the harvards of man, the entertainment of man, and and all of these things, even the compassion of human beings and the health care systems of of governments of, of human beings. But Christianity is about Christmas as well as the cross, as well as grace, and about the message that's from heaven, last I knew, right? And it's glory to God. Glory to God in the highest, in the highest degree, for God's sake and for the sake of sinners like you and me. Well, okay, let's go to the response. Let's go to the response of the shepherds. And again, you could pile up sermon after sermon here, but I, I want to move on, leave us with some practical things. The shepherds, having heard, the angels went away, and they heard, they said to one another, Let's now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's come to pass, which the Lord has made known to them. Just briefly about this reaction, people of God. It's so lovely. It's very simple. They hear, they believe, and they they follow the lead of the angel. He didn't command them to go to Bethlehem. But the lead of the angel was, there's a sign there waiting for you. Go. That's the idea. And so they discuss with one another, and there's no one of the CNN or the Fox News variety there. They're all believing together, and, and then they go. Well, that says something to us, first of all. When... God comes with the message of Christmas once again. There must be a reaction. There will be. What's yours? See, nobody can be neutral to the gospel preaching. It's you react and you go to Bethlehem or you react and you go away to Bethlehem because you're too busy and you want to celebrate all the gifts that you're about to get or receive. Where are you going today? Where where am I going when we step out of this place? Where? Where do we go tomorrow and the next day and so on? Well, think of that. Think of that. They heard the first Noel. The word of God. The amazing fulfillment of all things. They heard it. Good tidings of great joy. And they, they believed it. And note here. They weren't stuck on angelolily or whatever, the study of angels and the doctrines of angels and stuck on the brightness and the shining garments and the whiteness or brightness of the angels. No, they went to God and and they believed. Look, 
Verse 15, they say, let's now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Not angels. They took this as the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord through angels. Didn't matter the mediation as long as it was the word of the Lord. And they never hesitated to give God the glory and then to go. And we're not even told that they made provision for the sheep. They'd been so faithful in their occupation as we should be. You'd think that they would say, well, half of us, you stay behind or let's hire somebody and take care of the sheep. We don't know about that. I like that. Not that they didn't care, but their priorities were right. Like, it's so hard for us to have right priorities. To go to see Jesus at the prompting of an angel and the word of God is the first thing for you, for me. And God will take care of your sheep, of your children, of your husband, of your wife, your family, your work. As long as you're going to Jesus... They never hesitated. They went. They went right to Jesus. And when they saw him and the angel had given him the sign, you know, of this babe who's wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, he didn't stumble over that. That wasn't a problem for them. This one meanly wrapped. He's not in a palace. And we don't have to go through um, lie detectors and, and all of these metal detectors to get in to see him. He's available to us. He's right there. This is amazing. They didn't stumble at that. Because you see, they were pricked in their hearts of the freeness of the gospel, of the grace of God, of the God who comes down to right where we're at, right in our poverty, right in our sin. And he's saying, I love you. There's nothing in between us now. Because I've given my son to be in between us. He's the way to me. That's what God's saying. And the, angel, the shepherds saw it. Maybe it was because they were so poor and they were so despised. And to see this great contrast and to hear of it from an angel just was overwhelming them. You see, it was so godly to discover anew that Jesus came not to save because you're red or you're yellow or you're black or you're brown or you're olive or even because you're white. Christ is born this day for sinners. And sinners believe because they know their need and they know that God has provided for that need. This King of Kings, this Lord of our peace. And they're so moved. They're so excited. Oh, I wish we had that enthusiasm of shepherds. I pray for that, Sovereign Grace Church. Have the enthusiasm of shepherds, those shepherds, with joy unspeakable and full of glory, as Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, they were moved. It was glad tidings of great joy. Who can frown at that? You're supposed to smile. You're supposed to be happy. And they were so so moved they were that when they told these things to Mary and to Joseph and to others, it's no doubt that Mary and Joseph were not only listening to the words of the shepherds, they were feeling the spiritual magnetism, as it were, the power of the witness that these were giving, something more than the words. There were hearts affected. There were people who were taken up to heaven, as it were, and they were propelled into the earth as further angels, further servants of the Most High. It's as if the glory of the Lord had shone around them too. And everybody was getting to see the angels through the shepherds. Better than that, everyone was seeing God in the shepherds and hearing God in the shepherds talk to them through them. That was the excitement of the shepherds and their witness and so on. They were never the same, and people who heard them were never, never the same. You just hear it now. Oh, those shepherds. I don't see it that way. This is the CNN guy. I don't see it that way. 
Their going to Jesus was the first step toward bigotry. And they're believing the theology of those angels and, and all those words that they said, and, and it had to be this way, and this was the one, and this is the sign, was the first evidence of a prejudice of religion that really had gone bad and would show itself in bigotry and Christian crusades throughout the, the, the centuries that we're only starting to get rid of. See, some narrow-minded would say that this is the beginning of narrow-mindedness. This is these disciples of Jesus. They're going just to Jesus. Why didn't they stop off at Buddha? Or after Jesus, go to Muhammad. That, that would have been acceptable. Or do their, their homage to the other Greek gods and Roman gods that were there and, and available to worship, but they just went to one. Bigots. They do this right away. They don't even consult the scholars and the religious reconstructionists and higher critics. Just Jesus, they're saying here. And the critics say this is the first jihad, militant Christianity, which is a terror to the world. Don't believe that. Believe this word. And follow those shepherds. And as they return, that's significant. They, they went to Bethlehem and they didn't linger there and say, well, Christianity is all about sitting at the feet of Jesus and therefore I have no other work to do. Some do that. Some misguided young Christians. And I've known them and maybe you have. They think that Christianity is sitting at Jesus' feet and leaving everything and working not and not caring about mundane things like flipping burgers or tending sheep. The shepherds who return remind us that Christianity is being in the world and not of it, but in the world, glorifying God at whatever you do, whatever you do. Computer guy, you fix computers for God's glory. Engineer, salesman, even preacher, better do it for God's glory. Shepherds too. And you see, they don't abandon work, but it's now sanctified. They've seen the peace of the world, and now there's piety in their work. They go, you see, and they're praising God, praising and glorifying God, and now they're going to do it in the name of God, shepherding, and with a great hope, great hope that it's Jesus who's born will be their Savior, will die for them, and will come again for them. How are we doing? This is my final point. This is, this is for us. And I, I appreciate your patience in my following this stream of presenting these shepherds and all of their political incorrectness. I believe the Lord laid this upon me, though, because we want to be God's worshipers in the midst of our world. It's getting bad, really bad really hard to stand out as a Christian. Hard to be bold. Hard, very, very hard. Hard to be an angel. And I say that, that's what I am. A servant. Not angelic in the pure sense of the word. You know that. But a servant. It's hard to be a minister. And to, to come up here week after week and not be politically correct. Very hard. And it's hard, you see, to be a prophet, to speak from heaven, and not a man pleaser, to speak from earth. Pray for me for that, won't you? I'm sure it's hard for you, too. It's hard even to, to hear these sermons. You know, they go on and on. It seems like he's rambling, whatever. Well, it's hard to hear from a man. But remember God, who gives even imperfect angels as a means of grace. And that's important, very important. And so we want to be like shepherds. Here's some things. Into our culture we must go, and we must know our culture, know the people in whose midst we are. 
used to be they used to call the generation that was coming forth the generation X or Y or Z. And I think they were referring to the lostness of generations, baby boomers, those who had only one parent or none or, you know, whose parents got divorced and so on, but they're lost. Well, I want to give some other letters. As I've been doing all along, I want us to know that this generation in which we live is PC, generation PC, meaning that we believe what we want to believe within reason and law in order to tolerate others and be sensible to their feelings. That's the generation we live in. The generation PC, be, be right, be nice to people, be tolerant of people. Don't step on toes, not from pulpits either. This should be a friendly place here. And they wanted to find friendly their way, all right? They'll say that all are okay, everyone's okay, as long as you're not, you know, some terrorist and you, you step on toes or you rob us. In fact, other letters might be, I okay, you okay. I'm okay. You're okay. That's the world we live in. And books and philosophies have been promoted and written and preached and so on for generations about this. And the chickens are coming home to roost. This is we, the generation we live in. And our children live in. Everything's okay. Further, this generation can be called by the letter M. Generations sold out to the media to the internet, to dramatic production, to sports, everything for entertainment. I just said to someone the other day, I believe that greater than half of this generation is going to be lost at the hands of the internet. And I would challenge all of us here, maybe the young people especially, but also some of us in the, in the middle age and so on. I challenge you that, to do this. Fast from the internet for a week, I dare you. And then come back to me and say that your life suffered from it, I dare you. Come back to me, I think you will, and say, Reverend Dick, it was the best thing you ever said because I was stuck on it, I was hooked on it. I needed this distraction because I wasn't, wasn't really happy just doing the thing next to me and that was picking up the sheep or after the sheep that I was supposed to be a shepherd of, or whatever. It's a generation M for materialism, M for me and myself. Well, what about us, beloved? Who are we? Let's be positive. What are we as Christians on Christmas Day and all the time? Let's be a generation W, shall we not? That means white. Let's be white. You know what I mean. And I wish there were a black man red or yellow here, to hear what I mean. I don't mean color of skin. I mean white, washed in the robes of Jesus. That's what I mean. Living like that. White, whiter than snow. That's amazing. Winter wonderland. There's the gospel. The gospel. Whiter than snow. Unafraid to say that Jesus is Christ is born this day and it's about being whiter than snow, you red sinner, you. Believe. Believe. And then W stands for being word-centered. A word generation and a worshiping generation. For a generation G, it will be godly. For truth and for godliness, that means against ungodliness of every sort in the public and in the pew and in the pulpit for the praise of God. And then finally, a C generation. Sorry to bore you with all of these letters, but there's so many. We've got to be a church generation and a cross generation that is living and giving and praising God for Christ's sake even though we shed blood for it. That's the kind of Christians that are born again this day in the city of Grand Rapids for Christ the Lord and to live and die for him happily, yes, happily, because this one is our Savior true. Go in peace, beloved, with great joy.
That's the gospel of Christmas Day. Amen. Father in heaven, we pray your blessing upon us. This generation, they want so desperately to hear and to go to Jesus continually by prayer and to come from Jesus into this world and to be a faithful witness together, Lord, together for your praise, glory to God in the highest. Amen. Let's sing now our last Psalter hymnal from 339. Hark the herald angels sing. Let's sing uh, one in three, one in three of 339. After the benediction, we'll sing from a doxology from 304, the first stanza. Receive now God's benediction and go in peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.
Sovereign Grace Church, served by the ministry of Reverend Mitchell Dick, worships each Lord's Day at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. at the chapel of Kuiper College, located at 3333 East Beltline Northeast, between Three Mile and Four Mile Roads. You are most cordially welcome to join us for worship or visit us online at www.sgurc.org or contact us by phone at 616-406-8562. It is our prayer that the Lord would add his indispensable blessing to this ministry in order that his name would be glorified through the edification of his people and the translation of sinners out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear Son.